Okay, thank you, Gerald. And uh, uh, I will start my lecture right now. And uh, uh, the title of my lecture is Integrating Architecture with Landscape, My Design Experiments in China. So uh, in my design career of projects in China, uh, there's always, for each project, there's always the same question come out first. That is, uh, how can we design a modern building localized in an Asia culture? Why is this question so important? Because uh, modern architecture was born in Europe, 1920s Europe and uh, United States. And uh, so uh, we need to design the modern building in any industrialized country, that's for sure. However, we don't want to copy the, everything from the European and the US model of a modern building. So we need to localize the building into the Asia culture. And uh, uh, so many Chinese architects use this approach that is imitate traditional appearance of, uh, from the history of Chinese architecture. And uh, so I disagree. I think we need to find the local residents' habits in organizing space to serve functions. That is the deep structure of a traditional form not the, the superficial appearance of a traditional form, but the, how the traditional form create a, a life habit. So this habit must be still alive today. And uh, so for this purpose, I did a research on the certain characteristics of traditional Chinese architecture. Uh, which you can find in my website. So the most important characteristic of a traditional Chinese architecture is uh, a living condition, a living tradition. That is the integration of indoor and uh, outdoor space. So if you look at uh, any traditional Chinese architecture, and uh, what you see is, uh, for example here, this is a, a, a famous garden in Suzhou, China. It's called uh, the Garden of Master of Fish, Fish, Fish Net. You don't see, you know, this is a garden, but it is also a big house. But you don't see, see a singleized building here. Rather, you see many, many small buildings. Each small building is uh, paired with a garden or some other kind of outdoor space. For example, here you have the living room and uh, it is uh, con connected to a small garden. This is a, a private study. It's, it's, it's facing the a medium-sized garden. So in each pair, the function is served by, both by the, the room and by the outdoor space. For example, here we can see a typical example. And you, you could read your newspaper, drink your tea in the room. But if you want, you could also bring your tea and the newspaper outside and uh, enjoy your, your, your reading under the greeneries. So relationship between the indoor space and the outdoor space vary according to the functions. So you probably would say, 
that that's uh, all the building look like like, like that could be doing that, but in fact it's not true. In the European tradition, for example, on the left, this could be a French chateau or could be a British country house. You can see all the indoor space is consolidated into a big chunk of solid element. It's like a castle. So all the green space is put outside, separated from this consolidated indoor space. And in the building elevation, you can see a very little opening is designed. And uh, so the emphasis is separate the indoor from outdoor, rather than communication between indoor and the outdoor. Now, even for the modern Western architecture, there's a lot of innovation, but uh, most of the, of the innovation is in the geometry of the form, rather than the indoor-outdoor relationship. So, I decided, you know, because this indoor-outdoor association is so important, I like to design buildings singularized in this, this particular tradition to reflect the local characteristic of my building in China. So in my 13 year experience, I conclude that there are four modes to integrate the buildings and the landscape. The first mode is the outdoor space as an alternative place for indoor activities. The second mode is uh, architecture and the landscape, each playing a unique role in a functional pair. The third approach is uh, architecture partially taking the form of landscape. And the last one is uh, garden as uh, urban public space in a building. So let me use one of my buildings to illustrate the first mode, outdoor space as an alternative place for indoor activities. So this is, this is the most used uh, integration. So in this mode, people must be able to move smoothly between the indoor and the outdoor space to allow indoor activities to be expanded into the garden setting. So the building is a reception center, Minghang Ecological Garden in Shanghai, China. So Minghang is a satellite town of Shanghai. So in the middle of the city, they build a, a sequence of large gardens, large parks. So within the one of the park, the, the city want to build a small facility called the reception center. That include two rental facility. So local company or industries can rent one of the facility to, to have a Christmas party or office retreat. The third building is for the park administration. So previously they hired another architect to do the scheme, like something like this. So basically it's, uh, he designed the three buildings and uh, each building contained uh, one of the functions. So this is the, the typical of uh, imitation of the Western tr traditional architecture. Remember the country house we, we saw earlier. So I told the client, by doing this way, the outdoor space is useless. Why? Because uh, this uh, complex is next to the public park. So people, all the public view will be able to see 
what's what's going on here. So you no longer have a privacy by using this uh, uh, outdoor space. So I propose to design the three courtyards surrounded by a wall. So this is a two rental facility. This is the park administration. However, we are not uh, simply imitating tradition neither because uh, modern life is different from traditional society. So I want people still be able to see outside when they are in the, in the conference facility. So I designed the uh, South North Canal, penetrating the three courtyards. Also, I designed uh, several visual channels east to west. So by doing this way, people inside of the conference facility still could have a peak outside to have a connection with the public life. So this is the floor plan. This is the first floor plan. This is the second floor plan. So here is the three courtyards. This courtyard on the southern end containing the park administration. This courtyard is called uh, uh, the, the village of Reeds. It is one of the rental facility for, the, for office retreat and the Christmas party. The second courtyard is uh, called a secluded place. So in each courtyard, you have a conference room, dining room, and you also have a private room. So inside of each room, I designed some outdoor space. For example, here, I designed a waterfront platform to work with the conference room. For this uh, private room, also I designed another kind of green space to be used by, by the people there. Same thing is here. Even for the second floor, you have a roof deck, roof garden to be used along with the room. So this is the southern facade of the park administration. So from here, you can see that a north and south canal penetrating the, all the three courtyards into the depths of the building. So people inside could see outside. This facade has a double facade feature. So the double facades allow you to design the balcony between the two walls. So office workers could use the balcony for some activities expanded from inside to the outside. For the manager's office, you could also have a recessed balcony. So he could expand his daily activity into the outdoor space. So that is what I call the indoor-outdoor uh, sharing. So now we come to the west side of the, the building complex. As I mentioned earlier, here you what you see is a continued blank wall to protect the privacy of the people inside. However, there's still communication between the inside and the outside. We designed a, a sequence of slits on the wall. So from inside, you could have a peek of what's going on in the park. So this is the entrance on the west facade. This is the entrance of a secluded place. So for the entering function, 
I designed both a room, a foyer, and a small bamboo courtyard. So you could greet in your guests either in the courtyard or in the room as you wish. So this is what I said. Uh, uh, the indoor activities could uh, spill out into the outdoor space. You could use either outdoor space or indoor space for, for the activity of that pair. So here, the bamboo courtyard and the, the foyer become a functional pair. This is the main courtyard of the, uh, the village of Reeds. So here is the reeds not grew up yet. So on this side is the conference, conference room. So you can see that during a break of the conference, people can use the waterfront platform to have a small talks and relax themselves. Meanwhile, these private meeting rooms also have their green space outside. So people could relax or even pull their table outside to have the meeting outside. So this is the reeds grew up, this picture of the reeds grew up. So you can see the reeds become almost like a green wall. So to create a further separation between the private rooms and the conference room. And for the second floor, you also have your roof garden. So this is one of the roof gardens. This is where the canal penetrating the, the building in the village of Reeds. So this is the picture when you are in the second courtyard, this is the you are in this courtyard is uh, the village of uh, the secluded place. But uh, through a gate, you can look into the first courtyard and uh, the park administration courtyard. So you could you could have a glimpse of what's going on in the city outside. That will create a mystery of space. East or west or west, we also have a similar village uh, visual channels. So this is the uh, slits cut onto the walls. So you could have a peek of the, what's going on in the park. So here, we are not uh, entirely imitating traditional form. We need to transform the traditional form to cope with the modern life, you know. So we do not emphasize too much on privacy. We also emphasize on communication. So this is the main courtyard of a secluded place. Now, by the way, why I designed the uh, village of reeds? Because the canal li line up with the reeds is a very typical rural landscape of Shanghai. There's another major feature of uh, Shanghai's rural landscape. That's the fish pond. So I, I used the fish pond as a, as a theme for my second courtyard. This is the conference building. These are the private meeting rooms. So they all enjoy a little bit of outdoor space. For the conference room, you have a grassland in front of it. For the private meeting room, you all have a, 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 a garden in front of it. For the second floor, you also have a roof garden. And what's more, you still could uh, use a staircase, come down to join people downstairs.
So this is where I come to the north end of the secluded place. From a bridge, I could look into the, the first courtyard and the park administration courtyard beyond. So you can see the canal here really create a lot of mystery of space. So in the first early slide, if I turn around, I see the northern end of the canal. Here I designed the fountain. So the second approach to integrate the building with the landscape is called the architecture and the landscape each playing a unique role in a functional pair. Now in the first mode, basically is a, you can do this functional activity in either outside or inside. So you can enjoy the security and the protection of the indoor space, but only walk a few steps, you could enjoy sunlight, breeze, and greenery. So this is the whole idea of uh, spilled activities into the outdoor space. But uh, there are some buildings where the functional pair, they have a different rule. For example, in a religious architecture, you have a profane space and the sacred space. In a museum, you have a space for viewers and the space for the exhibits. And in garden building, the, you have a viewfinders and the views themselves, which are created by the viewfinders. So this mode is to try to let the architecture and the landscape each playing a different role in the functional pair, rather than exchangeable. So the building I'm going to use to, share, to illustrate this point is the New Jiangwan Ecological Exhibition Center in Shanghai. Now, the project is based on a bigger preserved green space, uh, wetland in the northern suburban of Shanghai. This uh, wetland used to be a military airfield, but after 50 years uh, unused, nature reclaimed this wetland. So today it has become a really a uh, nature reserve. However, because uh, this uh, site is surrounded by fully developed high-rise buildings, so you don't want people to walk in the reserve freely because that will destroy the ecological system within one week. So uh, the city decided to build an uh, observation and uh, exhibition building on the west side of the nature reserve. So for the time being, the public could use this building to have a glimpse of the nature reserve. But in the future, they can use, they can add a two elevated walkway. So when the public is being educated well enough, and they could still, they could explore the nature reserve by walking on the elevated walkway into the wetland. But for the time being, only the building is open to the public. So I get the design responsibility. So in the Western tradition, especially the modern building tradition, Museum is always designed in the model of a black house, a black box. So basically so you build a building and put the dead animals and uh, uh, artwork, sculpture, 
inside of the building. And uh, the, the, the room is completely artificially lit, air conditioned. And uh, so for our project, the, the exhibit is a ecological system. The green reserve is surrounding the, our site. So I'm thinking, why not uh, let the landscape to become the living exhibits? Let the building only contain the viewers. So we will open different windows on the building. So viewers in the uh, building will be able to see the exhibits outside in the landscape. So in this case, the architecture containing the building users and uh, the landscape will become the exhibits. So the most important window I designed is an underwater window because the, the wetland is always a mystery to me. So I only see wetland from above the water level. And I, I always want to know what's going on inside. I remember there used to be an advertise, uh, ad, advertisement uh, in the PBS. Uh, a boy put a, a video camera inside of the washing machine. And uh, the end slogan is uh, being curious. So I like to know what's going on inside of the wetland. So I designed the glass window, goes all the way from the above the water level to the water body, to the wetland bottom. And so you can see a full section of the, the wetland. There's another idea is, uh, I try to let the people explore the, see the wetland in a gradual, gradual revelation. So I don't want to reveal everything too early. So this is uh, the building facing the urban street is covered with mud. We also planted trees on top of it. So people walk into the building, they gradually see the wetland. Only finally they come to the roof, they see the full view of the wetland. So this is the first floor, actually is also underground floor plan. This is second floor plan. This is the third floor plan. So we come down to the first floor, the underwater window is here. And uh, then we come to the second floor. There's a sunken courtyard here. I will give you more details later. So finally, we come to the roof. There's an observation deck. So this is the entrance of the building. So you can see the building disappeared behind the trees. And uh, in order to enter the building, you have to go downstairs. So that create a mystery of exploration. So when you walk up to the first floor, you suddenly see the underwater window. So the landscape really become a exhibit. People standing in the building to enjoy the view. So this is what I call the, they each play a unique role of the functional pair. So here you, you need the exhibits, you need the viewers. So they are each side of a functional pair. So the space in the building is not like a pancake. You have a second floor on the first floor. There's a lot of vertical spatial flow. On the, the opposite to the underwater window, there's a, a bigger pit. There's a bigger model of the computer, of the uh, wetland inside of the pit. 
you could use your laser pointer pointing any place because we designed, uh, we embedded a five hidden camera in the wetland. So the real time image will be broadcast on the screen. So the, I think these are windows too. These are electronic windows. So now we come to the second floor. These windows are not uh, transparent because I designed uh, a film which is showing the map, historical map of the wetland. Because I don't want to reveal the space, the wetland too early. So we keep working towards the other end. So at the, this end, there's a, a sunken courtyard. So typical plants of the wetland were selected, uh, planted here. They are not a dead uh, species, they are alive. So people, again, here, the building provides space for the people. The landscape is become the exhibits. So they each play uh, one side of the functional pair. Exhibits, museum goers. So finally, you come to the roof deck. So here you finally see the panoramic view of the wetland. I also I designed a cantilever the uh, observation deck. So you could have a closer look of the uh, the wetland. So this is the east elevation of the building. So you can see the building almost like a sunken into the water, submerged into the water. So again, here you see how the building is submerged into the water. So this is the first floor. This is the second floor. This is the roof deck. This is the, the wilderness of the wetland. So this is the evening view of the east elevation. I see the window almost look like a monitor. The third mode of integrating architecture with the landscape is to make architecture partially taking the form of landscape. Now, why we need to do that? For example, because this integration can reduce the impact of the artificial building form, achieving a better balance between architecture and the landscape in a project. But we need a, a server warning. The transformation aims at implying rather than faking the nature. So I'm not talking about the painter building green and make it look like a artificial hill. And um, this is like a too vulgar. Uh, I'm saying is a use of more abstract methods to imply the building is an artificial hill. And uh, why we we are arguing for architecture partially taking the form of a landscape? Because uh, only when you do it uh, partially. So people will still see there are two kinds of environment, the garden and the, uh, the building on the site. So the project I'm going to use to illustrate this approach is a mixed use complex in li lifestyle park in Kunshan, China. Kunshan is a medium sized city West, west side of Shanghai. And uh, many of our iPhones are produced there. So the site is a river island in the middle of the Kunshan city. So here you see there's a three or four canals. They, 
at the, their merging point, there's a river, connect, river, river island. So this uh, island is a complete uh, landscaped, but it's uh, vacant, vacant. It's not used for any purpose. There's no buildings on the island. There are three small hills on the island. So the city want to build uh, several cultural and commercial buildings on the island. So this is the, the planning for this island. So you can see building A, building B, building C, building D, E, J, K, and H. Uh, so all these buildings are for cultural function, like an exhibit and the bookstore, uh, but also for commercial purpose. There are restaurants, coffee shop. The city wants all these commercial and the cultural buildings to be mingled with the landscape setting. So create a new type of shopping center. So it, it, it's actually the shopping center, but uh, it does not look like a shopping center. It looks like a, more like a, a park. However, in order to achieve this purpose, I find out that the building is too much, too, much, too many buildings. And also the building is too big. The existing landscape is very plain. Basically it's the three hills, low hills. One is here, another is here, the third one is here. And uh, the trees on the hill are not fully grown. So the landscape is uh, pretty modest. So if we design these buildings like a regular building, they will overwhelm the uh, existing landscape, will destroy the whole concept. So to prevent the large building volume from overwhelming the existing plain landscape, the first floors of the buildings are made to resemble hills and mingled with the existing small hills, creating a podium looking like a new bigger hill. So this is the first floor. But it made it look like a man-made hill. So this is actually the second floor, the third floor. So we mingle this man-made hill with the existing hills. These are existing hills, three hills. And uh, so here you have a clear view. The first floor of the building is made look like a hill. But uh, th this is, there's actually, there's rooms inside of the first floor. By doing this way, the building you see is only the second and the third floor. So this is the west view of the building. So this shows much better. Actually, this entire construction is a buildings. This is the second floor, this is the third, uh, third floor, this is the first floor. But the first floor is buried uh, with the existing hill. And also eventually it will be covered with uh, ivy. And also we're gonna plant a lot of trees on the existing hill. So what you see is that instead of a, a bigger building with a three story high, now you see, a smaller building with only two story sitting on a podium, which actually is one part of the building too. So that will make the architecture have a better balance with the landscape. It will not overwhelm the landscape. So in this rendering, I took out all the trees and the greenery. So you can see the building idea clear, more clear. So this is the first floor, second, third floor. And the second and third floor 
is consciously designed in a different form. So the first floor is a, has a barren retaining wall. So make, make, it, make, a, make it look like a, a, a hill. Meanwhile, the second floor elevation is much more lighter and delicate. So this is the rendering, which included the greenery inside of the view. So you can see the first floor almost disappeared. What do you see as a green hill, uniting the new addition with the existing hills. Meanwhile, the building become much smaller. So here is the building section. So I could show you. This is the first floor. This is the first floor. This is the second and the third floor. These are existing hill. So you can see the building is half buried with the existing hill. Then you probably have a question. So how the first floor get a light? In fact, uh, it's okay because I designed a courtyard, green space along the edge of the first floor. So this is the courtyard. This is the courtyard. So this is the a rendering of the first floor when it, it is built. So you can see this still get a natural light and the natural ventilation. By doing this way, the architecture partially taking the characteristic of a, a hill. Therefore, it creates a better integration between the architecture and the natural setting of the park. The last approach to integrate a building with landscape is the gardens as a urban public space in a building. Now, Chinese cities has a traditional problem. Traditional Chinese cities lack nodal public space. Now, what is nodal public space? That is like a plaza, square, or a park. Traditional Chinese cities usually just expand their sidewalk to accommodate people's social activities. However, in modern city, this is not enough. So I propose this approach to let us, let us, if we encounter a new public or commercial building, why not try to, to design more small public gardens into the first, first and second floor of the new public and the commercial building. So that will create more public rooms for the, to relieve the shortage of public space in Chinese cities. Also very important is China has a growing civil society, provide more public space in the city will encourage the growth of the civil society. We all know that in Chinese cities, because of the lack of public space, the, the, the retired people, they are fighting for public space, but they are dancing social needs. And uh, so I think we should use the opportunity for new projects we should design more public gardens inside of the uh, first floor and the second floor. And also that will allow the activities in the building, in the new building, to be able to spill into a setting much better than enlarge the sidewalk. Because the sidewalk is linear. It's not a, geometrically, it is not good for 
uh, social activities. So it's much better to let the activities spill into a park or plaza. So the building I'm going to use to illustrate this point is a visitor center, Xingxi Park in Kunsan. Now in the west side of Kunsan, the city built a linear park between the two high-speed railway line. This linear park uh, in destroying, we only show the east end of the linear park. The linear park expanded, continually expanded into the west side, all the way until they, it meets uh, the Yangcheng Lake, uh, a bigger lake. So the linear park is three kilometers long. And uh, uh, at the east end, there is a railway station plaza. So the city decided to build a visitor center in a site next to the plaza. So this is a sunken road. And uh, uh, there is an existing footbridge go across the, the sunken road, connecting to the building site. So I think this is a good opportunity to design a public space in the visitor center, because the visitor center itself is uh, almost like a semi-public. So, so why not add a public space there? And also, I hate the traditional way to design visitor center in China, because people almost see the visitor center as a place for only for restaurants and uh, shops. So they only consider the materialistic uh, functions of the, the space. I think uh, a good uh, visitor center, really the first uh, task really should be increase people's curiosity towards the park they are going to enter. So make the visitor more eager to start their travel, their journey. This is supposed to be the, uh, the real function of the visitor center. So why not uh, design a public space for the other spiritual function of the visitor center? So I decided not to put the entrance to the visitor center at the same level of the site, but rather use the footbridge as the entry to the visitor center. So by doing this way, now this is the footbridge. You can see it's a one story higher than the, the site. The site is one story lower than the railway station plaza. So this is an opportunity we should make a full use. So I put the entry here rather than here. So people enter the visitor center is on the roof. So we could design the roof plaza and make a full use of the building structure for the public space. So I designed the plaza, roof plaza here. So people enter the visitor center from the footbridge. So all those commercial function, utilitarian function are still there. They are placed on the first floor of the visitor center. So here is uh, the shop, which you can buy maps or buy souvenir. And this is the public bathroom. This is the bicycle rental. There's also a boat appears. And uh, here you could uh, uh, get on the horse draw carriage. So we start our journey at the beginning point of the footbridge. So here you can see 
the the visitor center is half hidden behind the, the bridge. It creates a mystery of space. So now we go across the footbridge. We see the roof plaza. However, the roof plaza is completely circulated by concrete wall and aluminum screen wall. So you don't see much outside of the, the plaza. Only at the end of the journey, there's a half circle moon gate which will give you a glimpse of the park beyond. So I designed the pool, reflective pool here. So this is the whole idea. When people come to this point, they see the part of the park. The pool is a function almost like a, a path, a water, water surface path. But the people obviously know they cannot walk on the water. So they have to find a real way to come to the park. So that'll create a temporary delay. That'll create an inspiration for their, to increase their appetite to explore the park. So that's the whole, whole idea. Increase the interest of the journey. That is, should be the real function of the visitor center the spiritual function. So this is a look like an illusory path into the park. So people gradually know they have to use another path. That is on their right side. There's a grand stair. They will come down. So the temporary delay increased the mystery. So you come down to the stair, grand stair. So here is the first floor. This is the public bathroom. This is the, the glass cylinder containing the, the shop. Behind the concrete wall is the pool we saw earlier. So there are also uh, boat pier. There are bicycle rental at the, the, that part of the building on the first floor. So this is the west view of the West Center, facing the three kilometers long Linnell Park. This is the railway station. The railway station plaza is behind. So this is the elevator tower for the handicapped. So you can see the, the roof plaza is uh, floating on top of the first floor because the maintenance vehicle of the park needed to cross the building frequently. So we cannot design the complete seal out of the first floor. So there should be no thresholds, everything here. You allow the maintenance vehicle going across the building quick, frequently. This is the glass cylinder, the glass cylinder here, which is containing the shop. So here you have an interesting echoing because the, the glass cylinder is a circular in plan. It creates an interesting echo with the vertical circular moon gate. So both are circular form. When is the horizontal, when is the vertical? This is the evening view of the Mount Gate. It's interesting to discover at the end of the, uh, after the building was uh, finished, we discovered to our surprise, there's many couples, young couples, they come to this uh, location to hold their wedding ceremony. So that really teaches me a lesson. You know, as long as we architects dare to imagine, 
and design accordingly, carefully. The public will know how to use the building, the public space, to its best of purpose. So uh, we should uh, trust the public to be able to use uh, the public space we design. So the lecture is uh, based on a new book of mine, a dialogue between architecture and the landscape. If you want more information, please visit my website, www.humiao.net. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miao. I have to say, um, in all the years I was traveling around China, I didn't see many examples of architecture quite as uh, beautifully integrated into the uh, landscape. Uh, but um, I, I, unfortunately, we, we've, we've run out of time, but I, I do have one quick question for you, which is how common is it uh, in China now for municipal governments to be as uh, far-sighted or broad-minded, if you will, as as the ones that you've worked with in, in Shanghai and, and Kunshan. I mean, is there much of this going on or is this uh, the exception and not the rule? Okay. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a really completed by chance. Uh -huh. So if you, you see the, the head of a, of a municipal government is interested in architecture, in inventive architecture. And uh, then you get the opportunity to, to design and build uh, such a project, so, so just like what uh, my projects uh, show. Yeah. yeah. But uh, not many people uh, in the government uh, actually uh, get into that level of understanding. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and also, many, unfortunately, many Chinese architects, young Chinese architects, are only interested in copying current uh, fashionable Western style, yeah. like a Frank, Frank Gehry's design, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The design. Yeah. So they don't want to look at the connection between landscape and architecture. I feel that's uh, old fashioned. Anyway, this was uh, wonderful. And uh, I, I, I just hope that somehow your ideas can be spread even farther afield. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Diana, I think, uh, to let her uh, bring this to a close, unless Gerald has something to say. Well, I, I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Miao again. Uh, he, he was a wonderful presentation, uh, really insightful. I, I, I am looking forward one day to going back to Shanghai and taking a look at all of these uh, uh, wonderful sites, um, especially the parks um thank you very much